come to talk. Um, these talks are made up as I go along. So therefore, there is no script, there is no paper to give to you. There will be a series of images, and the time that this talk lasts is determined by the hourglass. So if the talk hasn't finished, but the time has finished, then we finish. We can do another talk afterwards, if needs be, but each one is separate. So when I turn that over, we begin. But before we begin, I want to try to explain that anything within this talk will have some reference to Stern and his writings. So therefore, my approach to it is in the tradition that Stern would salute, I believe, which is that if you don't know what to say, make it up. <laughs> Because it depends on your response to the images to some extent as to how far we go down each particular journey. The title is quite extraordinary as far as I was concerned. And it was one of the ingredients which made me feel enthusiastic about coming to talk to you in Mexico City after your kind invitation was because of pronunciation of it. Las Thank you. <laughs> the beauties of Stern. Well, those words I put into Google. Ah, we should begin. So this determines the time. And if you would keep your eye on there, if it stops, give it a little shake, please, and tell me when it reaches the end. And this is a significant object where Stern is concerned, because it contains three different time areas. This is the future. This is the past. And there, at the centre, is now, the present. Now, and now, and now. And it continues all the way through. And Stern's obsession and understanding of time, and the use of time in Tristram Shandy, is an important ingredient. And so this hourglass, which is also a memento mori, it reminds us of life and its passing. There are other objects which we associate, especially in England, and I'm sure more in Mexico, to do with time. There is the skull, a significant example, which we see on grave markers in England. There is the scythe that cuts down all that goes before it. There is the candle and the flame, which is blown out. And there is the butterfly, which is a transient and changes from one state to another, as does the moth. All of these ingredients are part of what is contained within this one object. So therefore, whenever I give a talk, I always take an hourglass with me. This has come from England, so it's come very delicately. <laughs> so we have now begun. And we will move to the first side. This is, um, this is known as a hatchment. It comes from the French, la chèvement. And it shows the history of a family and how they marry and how they interrelate. And on here you'll see that the different families' coats of arms are put together, each different family creating a new family containing the history of the past. Normally there is a motto in connection with heraldry, and in this particular case the motto is written here. I don't know whether you can read it clearly, but it says, Bon et bel assez. Bon et bel assez. And that is a, a clever interpretation of the family name. My name is Wild Gust, so therefore, if I want to represent my name, then a big wind blowing is one that would be appropriate. Bonne et say means to be good and beautiful is enough. But here, it refers to the Bellasses family, so it's a play on words. The Bellasses family, Bonne et say. so it joins together. Is that clear? Okay, well, that fits in with that first part of my title. And here, this little image is taken from a pirate edition of the life and opinions of Tristan Shandy. When Stern was writing, people wanted to capitalise on the fact that his writing was selling well, and so variant forms of Tristan Shandy, which were not written by Stern, were produced to sell to people. This is Stern's new book. It wasn't Stern's new book, but nonetheless people bought them. Well, this comes from an edition which was sold in Ireland, and it was volume 9 of Tristram Shandy, but it was not written by Stern. But the little engraving 
says, si je le perds, je suis perdu. If I lose the stars to guide me in the direction I am lost. Well, those stars were quite important because Stern was known as the vicar of stars, the vicar of asterisks that he uses in his text if he wants to disguise his meaning or he wants you to understand what his meaning is by you providing the words. So this particular image seemed to be appropriate as well for the beauties of Stern. The Bellas' family, the connection, looking at the stars, is there Stellas? Is that correct pronunciation? And, thank you. And so this is a sort of a little image again, which sums up some connection with Stern. One of the things that one of the things that is important about Stern, as far as I'm concerned, is his spirit and where we can find examples that will fit in with our understanding of what such an interesting and complex man is. So here is a copy of the book, which goes by the title, The Beauties of Stern. And these little books were produced after Stern died, whereby all the best bits, all the good bits of his writings were kept together. So there was the beauties of Pope, the beauties of Swift, the beauties of Johnson, and the beauties of Stern. And these are extracts, the good aspects, the good bits. Not all the stuff which was questionable and which people thought was a bit strange, but nonetheless, this is the best bits of stuff. And that's what I'm going to try to do to you, or help you to understand, in the next hour. So here is the prayer. Because Stern was a vicar, and I believe that it's necessary to focus our minds so we will begin with, O ye powers, for powers ye are, and great ones too, which enable mortal man to tell a story worth the hearing, that kindly show him where he is to begin it, and where he is to end it, what he is to put into it, and what he is to leave out, how much of it he is to cast into a shade, and whereabouts he is to throw his light, ye who preside over this vast empire of biographical freebooters, and see how many scrapes and plunges your subjects hourly fall into, will you do one thing? I beg and beseech you, in case you will do nothing better for us, that wherever in any part of your dominions it so falls out that three several roads meet in one point, as they have done just here, that at least you set up a guidepost in the centre of them, in their charity, to direct an uncertain devil which of the three he is to take. This is central. To stir. The idea of me now, here, which way do I do it? How would I do it? Because Stern is such an enormous person. His writing is such an enormous complex piece of writing. How can I compress it? What, how shall I do it? You wake up in the morning and you decide, this morning I will do this and this and this and this. I will be organized and I will do all these things together and I will follow a straight path that will be successful. And then what happens? You lose your keys. Yes? The phone rings. There is a distraction. Something happens and your path is altered. So you need help. I need help all the time I'm in Mexico City because I don't know where I'm going and I don't speak any of the language. So I have to rely on people saying, yes sir, it's this way. Go this way. Follow this way. And Stern is asking within his book in the form of a prayer, a supplication, asking a divine power to guide him through the way he will try to tell what he is trying to tell, a story of life. So that is also essential in every talk I give. There is always a prayer and there is always time. Where now? Ah! This image. What do we see? We see a signpost with three points. We see two men. Yes. One older, perhaps, with his feet planted squarely with a stick. Another one, gesturing forward. A house in the background. A sunny day. What time of year? Your imagination is now beginning. Is this the beginning of a story? Is this the end of a story? Is it in the middle of a story? It could be any of those, could it not? 
We have here an image which is representative of a circumstance within a narrative. There are ingredients in this particular image that we will see are consistent with the way that this particular little game is devised. The game is called an endless landscape or a mirror armor. And there are 24 little cards. And those 24 little cards are represented by three just there. And each one contains a profile. It contains a pathway that runs from one to the next. It contains water in some form. It contains an horizon and also a hedge line that are common to each image. So therefore the images can be placed next to each other almost infinitely to create an always changing landscape. And it's called a miriorama. And it was invented in the 18th century. And these little cards here, when you lay them down and place them next to each other, they will create a story which can replicate itself endlessly. Now there are, within those three little cards, three times two times one numbers of variations. There's six varieties. Well, in this 24, it's a number that I can't really memorise because it is... 16885536159279223541877201 varieties of stories in one little pack yeah so if ever you need inspiration then all you need to do is look at one of these because you can make up a million stories for each image can't you well this was very fortunate in my starting at ah now then why did I put this here what does it say what does he say? Google translate it for me. Because I can't remember. Can you translate it for me, sir? Senor? Yeah? Sir? Yes? Said my mother. Yeah? But what is all this story? Right. Um, nothing more or less than a fable over a column. <laughs> Senor? And one of the best I've ever heard. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, because I can't remember why I translated this. So we go, in Tristram Shandy, we go to the end of the book first, which is the best place to start the story. It's at the end. And this is the end of the book. Can you translate again for me, sir? It's, or rather, in, in Spanish. Well, how do you pronounce this? Fin? Fin. Fin del noveno volume. Is that okay? Right. The end of the ninth volume. And the end of the ninth volume is where we discover that this is a cock and bull story. What's that? Ah. <laughs> they are, some of them are surprised to me. This is a significant and important image of a particular English actor who is quite famous. His name is Laurence Olivier. He was famous. You know him. Yeah. yeah? You know him. Did you see him? No. It took too long ago. Well, here we have the character seated in a graveyard gazing at a skull. Now, you are an intelligent and, and perceptive audience, and so therefore you automatically know which play this is from. Yeah, and you know which act it is. Act 5, scene 1. And if you remember, do you remember? Hamlet is walking through a graveyard, and he discovers there's a grave there, he doesn't know who it is to, he's no idea, it's a hideous grave that's being dug, and there are two grave diggers, and they're digging, and he asks them how long does a body have to be in the ground, and they produce evidence by saying, we know who this person was. And his name was... Yorick. Thank you. So Yorick is found, and Hamlet at this point is astonished because not only is he holding an actual skull in his hand, he is holding the skull of somebody that he knew. Somebody upon whose back he used to ride. Somebody who was a man of infinite jest. He used to make people laugh. And now he has become this. And this is a significant point in the play. And the connection between a play which is not a comedy, this is tragedy. And yet Stern chooses for the name of his main character, Parson Yorick. This is his reference. This is what we're to understand by the fact that he's naming those people in his book, which has very few characters. The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shandy has not many characters. They're all 
collectively put into a little set of circumstances where they can interact, sort of. But Yorick is slightly outside, but an important figure within Tristan Shelley. <laughs> Indeed. My poor, poor Yorick? Yorick? Yeah. <laughs> poor old Yorick. Well, Yorick, like all major characters <coughs> in all works of fic fiction, drops dead right at the beginning of the first book. <laughs> A major character normally goes through the story with you and he guides your way through it and you can follow him. But in The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shandy, on page 73, he drops dead. And this is where the book begins to become particularly interesting. The black page. The black page is an expression of something which is visual as well as textual. The important thing that you must remember is that it is composed of exactly the same ingredients that the rest of the book is composed of. It is ink and paper. This side, the ink and paper create text. This side, the ink and paper make an image. It's an image which you begin to interpret. And that occupies exactly the same space as the text block. So it's the same as the text. And we are to read it in the same way as the text. But it is for your imagination to take on the fact that this is the saddest page. This is the, the page that Stern is unhappy with, that Yorick is unhappy with, that you are unhappy with because you are reading the book. Because this character is now dead. And when I came to Shirley Hall, and I needed to try to find ways of making a museum in the middle of the country succeed, it was this black page which kept knocking on my head, saying, look at me. So I started to look at the ways that the black pages were represented in other editions of Tristan Shandy, because this image is from the first edition. And because Lawrence Stern made sure that every copy of every edition of Tristram Shandy, he supervised it through the press, then we know that this is exactly how he would have wanted it. Now I think, if I remember correctly, oh no, we'll go back to the black page in a minute or two. <coughs> Because this is the title page of the first edition. And it's an, it's an interesting title page because it contains the title of the book, The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shandy Gentleman, a little bit of Greek to indicate that he is trying to talk to a higher intelligence, perhaps, people who understand the classics. And then it gives the volume number and it gives the date, and the date is wrong. It's not 1760, it's 1759. So why does he put the next year's date on? Well, if you want something to be fresh, yeah? <laughs> so he decided that as it was December 1759, if he put 1759 on, then people would think that's old, it's old. It's old. Yeah. So 1760, the next year, means that it is still alive for a long year. So this is marketing. Yeah? <laughs> This is marketing. It's saying, this book has come out, it's new, it's fresh, and it will stay fresh all that next year. So this is tactic. The other tactic is, where is the author's name? It's not there. Who has written this book? So when people were introduced to the life and opinions of Tristan Shandy, then they were introduced to a book which has no author's connection. It's written by Mr. Anonymous. It's written by Mr. Question Mark. Who has written this? And the thing about this book is that it caught on immediately. Stern knew that what he had to do was to market his book. And so he seized on a tactic. Stern was a vicar. And he was a preacher. And because he was a vicar, he knew actresses. Most vicars know actresses. And this particular actress, called Catherine Formatel, was a significant character because she was a singer and an actress. Catherine. Catherine Formantle. And she was in York, and Stern was very fond of Catherine, and Catherine was very fond of Stern. And they both used to walk out together. He's a vicar, so it's perfectly okay. <laughs> and Catherine is quite significant and important because she knows David Garrick. David Garrick, the actor-manager, the performer, who is in London, 
and he is a significant and important man. And Catherine knows him. Lord Stern knows that if he is able to contact David Gary and make him aware of the life and opinions of Tristan Shandy, then this could be a good thing. Catherine writes a letter. Dear David Gary, I'm in York. I used to work with you. There's this book selling called The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shandy. I shouldn't be recommending it to you because I'm a woman. I should not be reading this book. But it's a good book, and it's written by Lauren Stern, and it's on sale now, and you ought to read it. In fact, you're so far ahead of everybody else that I'm sure you've already read it. But nonetheless, this is flattery. But nonetheless, I think you should read it. Signed, Catherine Formantle. Dictated, Lauren Stern. <laughs> Marketing, once more. So a letter goes to Garrick, and when Stern arrives in London, Garrick puts him up, he gives him his, his lodgings in London, he gives him his box in the theatre, he sets him at the centre of London life. So the book is being pushed up in focus. So this apparent neglect of information is actually central to Stern's interpretation of how he's going to make his book sell. Oh, now there's the beginning. Of the book, just to, you know, to recollect for you that I've taken from the translation by Javier Marias, which is, although I don't speak Spanish, I know what a brilliant writer Javier Marias is, so therefore I believe in his Spanish translation. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the beginning of this book which was the most important thing in terms of its understanding. I wish either my father or my mother or indeed both of them, for they were in, in duty both equally bound to it, had minded what they were about when they begot me. And what they were about, if you remember, was because, because Tristram's father was a military man, he was a man of regular habits. On the fourth Sunday of every month, he used to wind the grandfather clock on the landing. And because he was a man of regular habits, he attended to other matters, both domestic and marital, on the same occasion to get them all out of the way at the same time. <laughs> so Mrs. Shandy begins to associate the sound of the clock being wound with something else. <laughs> and she interrupts her, her husband one evening by saying, Pray, my dear, haven't you forgotten to wind the clock? <laughs> now, as a result of that beginning, this book became controversial and became funny. People loved the idea of this story. But it's a very questionable story, perhaps. But there is no author, so who has written it? What is going on? How is this book not introduced into London society? This is Stern. And this portrait by Joshua Reynolds made Stern into a celebrity. It has certain ingredients which forgive the sort of not perfect reproduction, but to decode the picture, we see a vicar, a cleric. He has around his neck a black preaching scarf, which you put on when you go into the pulpit. His finger is resting, pointing to his intelligence, to show he's an intelligent and witty man. His elbow rests next to a pot of ink. And a quill. He's a writer. He would be a writer. He's a vicar. He writes sermons. In fact, this is probably a sermon underneath his elbow. But if we look closely, it says, The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shelley. So now we know that the person in London who has been making us laugh with his book is wearing bands, is wearing his wig, slightly askew, slightly unconventional. This man is a man who is a vicar and should not be writing this sort of literature, perhaps. And that's the division point that always happens with Stern, is, is what he is writing acceptable or is what he is writing not acceptable? And you decide when you read Tristan Shandy as to whether it is the sort of a book that a vicar should be creating or not. When Stern arrived in London, he went down to find out how his book was doing that he'd sent down to London. Nobody would publish Tristan Shandy, he had to publish it himself. So this is an important ingredient because it means that Stern is able to do what you can do now. 
You don't have, if you want to write something, you don't necessarily have to send it to a publisher. You can publish it yourself, especially with the sophisticated ways that modern technology will allow you to do this. Well, Stern, because nobody would publish Tristan Shandy, he published it himself. And it meant that the cost of it had to be borne by him. He borrowed some money from a friend in York, and he sent those copies down to London, and then he went down to find out how they were doing, and he was told they had sold out completely. And the bookseller said, what else have you got? <laughs> what else have you got? We can make money. And he said, I've got my sermons. Well, the sermons, if they were brought out under the name of Lawrence Stern, nobody would know who had written it because nobody knows who Lawrence Stern is. The picture has been painted, but the association is not yet important. But now, he brings out his sermons under the name of his fictional character. So once again, Stern is marketing. He's taking the name that people know, Mr. Yorick, and he's presenting it as part of his push to sell copies of the sermons. And the sermons sell much more than the life and opinions of Tristan Shandy, because sermons are the barometers of the time. People read sermons all the time. And it's one of the things that I've been trying to do while I've been at Shandy Hall, is to try to encourage an understanding of the sermons, because the sermons of Stern are extremely interesting and extremely brilliantly written. And they're nothing like Tristan Shandy. There are no jokes. There's no humour. There's a little bit of humour in one or two, but on the whole, they are intelligent, perceptive ways of looking at the biblical text. And I recommend them to you. And that is where he lived, and that's where I live, <laughs> which is very strange. <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine. It's a beautiful house. You're welcome. Come and see it. It's very small. It looks quite peculiar. And it's, it's the house where Stern wrote Tristan Shandy. Not the first two volumes, because he wrote them somewhere else. But he was invited to be the vicar of Coxwold, which is where Shandy Hall is. And before Stern came, it wasn't called Shandy Hall. When he arrived at the house, that, he, that was the vicarage, his friend said, this must be Shandy Hall, this must be the place you're writing about. So therefore it took on its name in 1760, when he moved in, and he wrote The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shandy in a little room, just behind that hedge, just there. And that's on your picture that I gave you. That's an interior of what the cartoonist imagined that little room was like. And those are the nine volumes of the story. And the story itself, do you understand now why I put them in a row of nine? And why they're quite similar, pictorially, to these little cards. If you take Tristram Shandy as being nine little potential images that you can read in any order. It's not essential to go from the beginning to the end. Is there a beginning? There isn't an end, because it says, here endeth the ninth volume. In other words, there could be a tenth. So it's a, it's a book that plays around with form, and it plays around with ideas. Let's accelerate a bit more. And let's look at the other side of that marble page, which goes through the paper. It goes from recto to verso. It passes through, as if, perhaps, gazing down into the tomb. This edition, which I think is a Dutch edition, they wanted to save ink. <laughs> the editor said, black page, pa! Let's have a window, put a window in. <laughs> so, that's an interpretation. The French edition, aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, I do not like these black and white pages. Let's have some squares in. That's much more true. Hey, that's Bob Yuri. This is not sad. This is chess. <laughs> Here we have a tiny little one. <laughs> this saves money as well, isn't it? This is the English edition, the Everyman edition. God heaven knows why they did this. So this is this is where Stern is losing his respect because he made sure that everything was as he wanted it to be, whereas editors after, his di after he died decided it would be as they wanted it to be. Now, 
This edition, which you know. Do any of you know this edition? Ah, this is a beautiful edition of the life and opinions of Tristan Shandy, because this is playing around with a book that Stern was playing around with himself. So if we go to the black page, oh, but before we get to the black page, we have an interesting page on page 10118. Which is my room number at the hotel. It's <laughs> <laughs> true, isn't it? It is. Right. So on this particular page, ah, oh, it's creased. This is not very good. This is a brand new book. The page is creased. But if we read on the back here, it says, shut the door. <laughs> so at that point, where Stern wants to tell you a little bit of intimate secret, and he says, shut the door, in the text, yes. Well, here, the door is represented by a fold origami <laughs> in the paper where you can read what is behind the door. So this is a book that's starting to play around with the idea of Stern's way of doing it. Now, would Stern approve? Do you, as academics, approve of this? Let's go to the black page. The black page is preceded by, alas, poor Yorick, where the name of Yorick disappears down a stairway, downwards, wide, O, R, I, C, K. It's going downwards. And then we find that this happens to us all. The printer breaks down. Yes? And the printer goes bzz, 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 and starts to make all of the text into black pages. So this is the black page made out of the text of Tristram Shandy up to that point. So we've got a book which is playing around with the way that the book creates its own image. Do you see? So this is a book produced by visual editions. What they wanted to do was they wanted to set up a publishing house which would pay the same attention to the text as it did to the way that the text was presented. So here we can see all nine volumes of the book on the outside of the book because their own demarcation is with an orange band. So each time we get to the end of a volume, that colour is introduced. So we can see all nine volumes without even going into the book. This is clever. This is clever stuff. So, let's do that for a moment and move forward into another state. What's happening? Well, here is a grave marker, Lawrence Stern's grave marker, because, uh, should I tell you this story? It's quite a digression, you see, it means I've got to tell you all about it. <laughs> should, I that, should I do that later? Okay, let's look at this first. This is a grave marker which has been made out of stone, and it's been made out of stone and slate, and it represents the black page in Tristan Shannon. And it was made by a, a stone carver, there's a picture of it in front of... Pass them around, because each one of these is a different version of the black page by a different artist and a different writer. I asked 73, which is the page number, artists and writers to make a new black page. And they could do it in any way they wanted. On the back of each of them, there's some text and the text explains how they did it, or what they did, and why they did it. Just pass them around when you've seen them, have a look, because there is a wide variety of different interpretations of how they were done. And each one was asked to make his black page, or her black page. There's a beautiful one with a haiku. Yeah? That's a Japanese artist. So there's an one for you, and there's an one for you, and there's an one for you, madam, and there's an one for here. There we are. Pass them around, have a look. And on the back is an explanation. And I asked some very important and significant writers and artists to do a black page for me. And if they would please, would they sign their little work? And then I hid the, the signature. I put the signature behind the black border. 
So when you went in and you wanted to look at the picture that was done by the artist who you admire enormously, then you couldn't necessarily tell which one it was. It's anonymous, like the book, like the volumes of Tristan Shandy are anonymous. And I asked the stone carver to put a black page, laid it down in front of Stern's grave. And each artist was then thinking about what was their expression of blackness, their expression of sadness, their expression of totally dark. And each one came up with a version. And they were described on the back. And I sold them by auction. And we made money for the museum. So this is doing something in terms of an exhibition which is connected to the spirit of Stern. I expected 73 black pages. Honestly, I expected them all to be black, mm -hmm. but maybe done in different inks. But they were, their, their imaginations started to work. And if there is one thing that Stern is more than any other writer, he is a respecter of your imagination. What he wants you to do is think, and start to think, and continue to think. He's promoting the idea of you relating to the book in an imaginative way. How are we doing? That's okay. Slide 19. I couldn't make my mind about putting it in. I don't know what to do. Slide 20 was a problem. I thought a bit about what I could do, so I left that one as well. Slide 21, that was. They might come later. So we'll, if you can make a way for those, call me. That's good. Well, there's the stone now put in. And this was a Spanish, actually, this was a Spanish student. He arrived at Shandy Hall one afternoon and asked, could, would it be possible to, to go? And I said, yes, you can come and have a look, as long as you help us move this stone. <laughs> it was very heavy, I can tell you. And this is an artist friend of mine. And we placed it down and it commemorated the anniversary in 2009 of 250 years of the publication of the first edition of Tristan Shelby. So it was an anniversary, it was a celebration, and a celebration through death. And there is, that one is out there. This isn't all 73, because all 73 are contained in this little box, in there, which is a catalogue. And the catalogue can be opened with a knife, and you can find out who all the authors and writers are, but the only way to do it is to get the catalogue. So, madam, a gift. Oh. <laughs> if anyone wants to know what they are, then you can tell them. If you don't have to, you can just say, no, I'll tell you, if you don't want to. Okay? So, that's it. so there's one, that was done by a particular artist with his thumb, his thumbprint, identifying all the way through. And here, this one I love. I gave a talk in, in Tokyo last year, and this one, Nobody in Japan could translate this, this cursive script. One girl out of an audience managed to work out what this says. So it's a beautiful little haiku about the fact that it's something to do with the darkness of the evening and the sound of a dog barking. And it's, it's hand done, it's a beautiful piece. Yasune Tone, he's an um, experimental musician in New York. He used to work with Yoko Ono. And that's it blown up there. This... This is not Photoshop. <laughs> this is this is a moth. What's the Spanish for moth? <laughs> Thank you. This is Acheronte Atrus, the Death's Head Hawk Moth. The Death's Head Hawk Moth, I don't know whether it's in this country or not. It feeds on potato leaves. And it's it's this big. It's that big. Which probably for Mexico City isn't very big, but for England it's pretty big. It's a big moth. And the moth has associations with death, it's seen not as a, as, a, as a good sign, as a good, good omen, it's seen as a particularly difficult omen, and it makes a noise, it squeaks. So if you touch it, it makes a very high-pitched squeak. It's true! It makes a very high-pitched squeak. And it does that, it is thought, because it feeds on honey. It goes into beehives, and it feeds on honey. And this squeak, they think, is part of its protection, but I don't know. But the thing that was important was that on its thorax there was a skull. So there was a connection between the moth family and Lawrence Stern. So I started, well it didn't happen entirely like that actually. 
while I was one evening, I was at Shandy Hall and I went out for a walk and I was trying to think, how can I get people to come? How can I get people to come to this house? And I was sitting on a gate and it was sunset and a, a, a white moth flew over the hedge and came and above the road and it started to do this dance. And it went up and it went down. And then another one flew in over that hedge and it came and they both started to do this dance over the road. And I thought, this is really beautiful. This is, people should see this. But they won't, you can't guarantee they're going to do it on one night. You know, you can't send out tickets to say, come and see the moth do this dance. But they were all, there were seven or eight of them doing this dance. Really beautiful. And they were ghost moths. I've never seen them before. And I asked a friend who was a lepidopterist, and he said, yes, they're ghost moths. Every year, they do what's known as a lek. The word that we use for when grouse and when pheasants have this, they fight. Yeah? It's called a lek. Well, this was like a lek, but quite a civilised one, because they didn't fight. They're just attracting females by sending out pheromones. And the ghost moths were very beautiful. And I thought, this could be a way of making some connection with Shandy Hall, is to think of the idea of the fact that we've got gardens around where we are, and so therefore within those gardens, there's the possibility, maybe, of there being moths. And the best way to attract moths is to put a light out at night. And then they come. That's the garden. And there's a moth. Beautiful moth. Emerald moth. Beautiful moth. Tiger moth. Beautiful names. <laughs> Beautiful names. Read those names. They are poetry. And they're 18th century. They're 18th century names. Taxonomy. Linnaeus. The way that categorization in the Enlightenment, the way of taking and ordering and systematizing. And names like footmen. We don't have footmen anymore. They used to have in the 18th century. Chinese character, green carpet, clouded silver, green brindled crescent. These are names which people don't know anymore because moths are at night and people don't see them. So therefore, I started to trap moths. And I got money to trap moths, to bring children to come and look at the moths, because this is part of their education. They've never seen these things before. And it becomes that now we have a blog, which is on the back of that little piece of paper, where we record, with help from students from the University of Pennsylvania who come over, and we record, in a systematic way, in a scientific way, the life around the museum. Now, this may seem a little distant from Stern, but as far as I'm concerned, it is only a series of connections. That one's a nice one. That's a Rorschach. Yeah. You know the Rorschach test? Yes. Where you make it? That's a beauty. That was made with jet. Do you know what jet is? The jewellery. Black jewellery. Yeah? Which is made from Oricaria, which is the monkey puzzle uh, tree. And that particular one there was done by an English artist, and she ground down the Whitby jet to make black ink, and then folded it over and produced an image. It's a very beautiful one. Thank you, sir, for showing it. So, the moth became central. Volume 3. Stern's clever up to Volume 3. Volume 3, he becomes a genius. This is genius. The idea that you can create a book which is always different every time you look at it, irrespective, is something that nobody had conceived. The idea of the fact that whenever I see a copy of The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shandy, I want to look into it to see how have they done the marble page? How have they done the black page? What have they done? Because this process, and it's a significant process, and is referred to emphatically as the motley emblem of my work. Motley, multicolored, spotted. Emblem, representing my work. This is what the story is all about. This is what the book is all about. And what it's about is entirely up to you to interpret. Because Stern is providing a book which is endlessly variable. It never stays the same. While he was alive, because it's handmade. Have you, have you done marbling? Have you ever made marbling paper? Well, you take carrageen moss, which is, which is like a, a plant next to the sea, and you mix it into water, and it makes a sort of a size, and you put colour in, and you take a stick or a feather, and you swirl it all about, and you play... What's it called? Oh, I don't 
<laughs> but you, you know the process. Yeah. What's it called in Spanish? Do we have? Thank you. <laughs> so this papel mamboliero is put down and created. And every time you do it, you think that's a beautiful one. I will do one exactly the same. You can't. It is always different. So therefore, Stern has created a book which is endless in its variety. It will always be different. It is no use if it is printed. Even if it is printed with a printed marble page that is slightly different from the other one, it still looks the same throughout the edition. Whereas with this particular version, it is always different. So, how did they do it? Let's see. Volume 3. Here, we have half of a smile. Half of a smile. Okay, clever. But it's not my page. <laughs> but I wrote to them and said, will you explain where you did and why you did some of the processes in your book? And I said, you didn't make the marble page different every time. And they said, oh yes, we did. Because this is photolithography. Photolithography. Which means that those dots are arranged in a different order every time they are arranged on the page. So they did follow it through in their own way. So now we turn over and we've got a complete smile. One half on one page and one half on the other. I still don't think it's as successful as a proper marble page would be, myself, because they are beautiful things in their own right. But nonetheless, we're con continuing to conform to the idea of what the book is about. So, another copy of <coughs> Tristan Shandy. Another copy of Tristan Shandy. Always on page, not on, obviously not on page 169, because that doesn't apply because of the additions. But you see the variety. <laughs> so, in 2011, which was the anniversary of the marble page, I asked 169 artists and writers to make the emblem of my work. That's one. Again, signed underneath with the signature hidden. The catalogue will be sent by post. <laughs> <laughs> the emblem of my work. Not my work, but by an artist writer. The reasoning behind it? These are, some of these are seriously good artists, and their work fetches serious money. So, was it worth speculating on a picture of Snoopy? <laughs> because, because that's what it was there for, it was there to raise money. Don Quixote? Bam? Jumping off a cliff? That was the emblem of that particular artist or writer. And I managed, again, thanks to the generosity of artists, and writers, marbling, to marble. Yeah, that's the English word for marble. So that's Nancy Fabs, when we went yesterday to go and buy those, that was her contribution. When we went to get those little, um, I looked at them this morning, they're really good. What are we talking about? I'm talking to one person here, aren't I? Did Stern do that in the book? Occasionally, he, you know, doesn't he? He addresses the reader as an individual. And the separate thing is that we, in fact, what I did is I tried to line them up and try to identify each other. Yeah. But I, I need to help from, from you, actually, to identify all the different saints I can write them down. <laughs> so this is, this is also a statement which I think is quite useful and helpful, especially to somebody in my particular position. Digressions incontestably are the sunshine. They are the life and the soul of reading. Take them out of this book, for instance, you might as well take the whole book <laughs> along with you. Yeah? Understanding Stern is, is to understand what we tried to do with recently, which was to create a tote bag. I don't know why it's called a tote bag, but it's called a tote bag. And we got the picture of Stern, which is fine, and we wanted to represent Stern by a quotation. Well, those of you who know Tristan Shandy, you know, you've got your favourite bit, haven't you? There's a favourite bit that you can do and you can put on. Well, what we took was from A Sentimental Journey, or what I decided that I thought was the best, which says, What a large volume of adventures 
may be grasped within this little span of life by him who interests his heart in everything and who having eyes to see what time and chance are perpetually holding out to him as he journeyeth on his way misses nothing he can <coughs> barely lay his hands on. That, I think, is at, the, is at the essence of what Stern is about. The idea of the fact that there is this opportunity every day, this possibility every day of finding something which is going to be completely new and completely fresh and something which you can't predict, which you can't put on your shopping list of activities and that will be, if your attitude is correct and is, and is conducive to what is going to happen to you, then it will be to your benefit. And that's, I think, is a significant... Whether you agree with me or not, I don't know. But nonetheless. Another. The plot lines. You're familiar with the plot lines. Yeah. I mean, this is, this, is, this is clever. This is the ability to be able to say that... I'm trying to tell this story, but I can't tell it in the way that you might expect to be, which is in a straight line, and I'm going to go off on digressions, and I'm going to constantly try and look at the fact that this is how we've gone so far, and it's been alright, isn't it? It's been fine up to this point. So here is how I represented the story in volumes 1, and 2, and 3, and 4. And this is an unusual way, right? but again, it's visual. The, the, the meaning of it is different to all of you. Some of you may think it's not really very clever. And so you may think it's genius. It's your response to it, always, which is the important thing. Where Stern is en engaging you as the reader to be entertained. He, he changes the pitch of his voice occasionally in the book. He takes it right down and talks to the world. And sometimes he broadcasts. And sometimes he's entertaining and sometimes he's sad. And those two things are always bashed up next to each other. So you will find a particularly moving and deeply poetic book. And then he says, right, okay. Finish with that, let's go on with a, let's go on with a joke, let's go on with a laugh. Well, that's one of the, the criticisms of Stern that people have, some academics have, which this man is not consistent. This man takes comedy and tragedy and presents them next to each other, which is a tradition in medieval literature. You would always have that idea of the fact that you could go from the comic to the tragic. And the crucifixion of Christ and the mystery plays, you find that you get the jokes at the bottom of the cross. Because that is what keeps an audience entertained, is variety. And Stern creates variety by allowing him to believe, make you believe that he is making it up as he goes along. That was just to help, to remind you, in your own language, I'm reading it mentally. <laughs> I don't read it out, but I'm reading it mentally, so you should now have got to the end. And there's the other one on the other side. So, the local blacksmith. As a museum, I have to make sure my grounds are safe to the public. I've got some steps there. Can't have steps, you need a handrail. Well, the choice of handrails in England is awful. You get long tubes made of aluminium, horrible, and they bolt them to the walls, and they look awful. So I said to the blacksmith, read Tristan Shandy. <laughs> make me a handrail. Nice handrail, yeah, and it follows the plot line. But it also helped people down the stairs. So it's a good way of doing it, I thought. And then another example, and this is a particularly significant example of the mixture of the textual and the visual, where both the text and the image are given equal weight within the same page. So, whilst the man is free, cried the corporal, giving a flourish with his stick, Thus, now then, where do we start? Do we start with the flourish at the top, or do we start with it at the bottom? Hands up for the top. Is it for the top? So it's a sort of, <laughs> could be into a bow, couldn't it? Yeah, an elaborate bow. So you're a top woman, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so your imagination, so nothing to do with me. <laughs> From the bottom, perhaps, it could go like that. Yeah, a liberation. That's what this picture is about. Well, equally, the text is the same proportion as the image. So this, I believe, is part of that, that understanding of text and image which is best displayed in Japanese prints. Where if you're looking at a Japanese print, the image is given in calligraphy, yes, and the 
printing of the picture and the image is also, but they harmonize. They give an equal weight. Do you agree, sir? Thank you. <laughs> Have to go up the gallery, up the steps. And again, my blacksmith makes me the flourish. Now, there are no labels here. There's nothing to say, this is a reference to this is it. <laughs> it's just meant as an image. So that when you're at Shandy Hall, you can see there are things around you which are part of the environment, but are there for a purpose and there for a meaning. How are we doing? Yeah, that's okay. Fine, just a bit more. What, is, what does that mean? What does it mean? I've what a... Ah. Yes. Now, <laughs> Does that sound like a proper Spanish person? I hope so. <laughs> particular line is coming because of this page. Now, this is my next exhibition. This is the exhibition to come next year, if I can manage to persuade people, and also 147 <laughs> writers and artists. It's quite a lot, I can tell you. And what they will be asked to do, if any of you are friends with good artists in Mexico, please, honestly, let me know if you think they would be happy to contribute to the exhibition, which will be called Paint Her to Your Own Mind. So, close your eyes and think, women and men, of the most beautiful, beautiful representation of the female. Close your eyes. And now we've got a whole room full, haven't we? Yeah? Open your eyes. So we've now we've had that all of, in the room of all those different representations of beauty. And that's exactly what Sterling's doing. He doesn't introduce the character. We have a writer in, in England uh, by the name of A.S. Byatt. And if A.S. Byatt wants to introduce a new character into a book, then you get a description, and you get a description of the clothing. You get a description of the shoes, the hair, the, the weight, the colour of eyes, everything. And that takes up quite a lot. You get a full picture. But the picture that you create from her description is still the one that you make in your own mind. So Stern is not even wasting the ink. <laughs> this is the cheapest page on Tristan Shandy, isn't it? Because that is the space reserved and the cleverness is paint her to your own mind. Paint her inside your head and paint her as you would like. And that's a double meaning. And it's quite an important double meaning. So I'm hoping that, well, next year that, that will be the exhibition where we will have 147 representations of feminine beauty. And that's him. Out of, that's the head that it all came out of. And that head is in marble and was made by Nollikins. Nollikins, at the beginning of his sculptural career, Stern was in Italy with Garrick and Nollikins did a bust of Garrick and he did it by measurement, calipers. So the length of the nose was measured, the space between the eyes was measured and all the points were made to create an image that was as lifelike as possible. So we know that that is what Stern looked like. I mean, there's going to be a little bit of buffeting, to some extent, to make it perhaps slightly more palatable, but it's classically done. He's, he's wearing no clothes, there's no wig. It's a particularly sensitive and rather beautiful head, I think. And it's, we have one at Shandy Hall. There aren't many, there are about six in total, but we have one at Shandy Hall. And it does seem to communicate the idea of the fact that this measurement, which is significant, because it was important when Stern died. And when Stern died, he was buried in St. George's Fields, Hanover Square, which was not the best place to be buried, because that's where all the resurrection men went to find bodies for anatomical investigation, and they would sell. Yeah? So you don't really get... In fact, they hired a man with a dog to try and stop all the resurrection making coming. And it's reported in the Gentleman's Magazine that they stole the dog as well. As the <laughs> Great. So, Stern, however, was there but two days, and his body disappeared. And it ended up on the anatomist's couch in Cambridge. 
And while the anatomy lesson was taking place, somebody in the gallery saw and recognised that it was Stern. Stop! You can't do this to Stern! So it was stopped. The investigation was stopped and he was reburied. <laughs> and then he stayed there until 1969 when the... of a character called Tom Rakewell. And Tom Rakewell was an aristocrat's son, and it looks as if he was embarking on a, a journey of li through life which was going to be fortunate. But unfortunately, he wasn't very bright, and he had lots of people all around him, and his descent as a progress, I mean, it's an ironic title. So Ra the Rake's progress is from a secure environment to madness in a lunatic asylum. And each stage is represented. So I asked a, write, a, a graphic novelist if he would do Yorick's progress from where Yorick is invented by Stern in his imagination to his death. And it creates eight images, which are, of which this is image three, when he's in the study at Chamillon. And if you look at the books on the little page at the side, you see there's, there's works by Hume, and there's works by Rabelais, and there's works by Ulysses. Ulysses? What's that doing there? Well, we've got different works <laughs> been incorporated. B.S. Johnson is there as well, I think, and Jonathan Coe. Tale of a Tug, that's there. And also, can you see the little head on a viola de gamba? Because Stern played the viola de gamba. He was a musician. So that is resting in the corner, and his cat is there as well, and that's the significant. And the hourglass, of course, and he's studying the modern pages. And there's a, there's a £25 note that Garrick has... Um, left him, he's given him some money, and outside in the tree, can you see the starlings? Yes. Can you see them? And they're all being taught to sing, to sing, I can't get out, I can't get out, which is a reference to a sentimental journey, if you know that. Well, the starlings have to be taught that. And outside you can see the church, where he preached, and then there's a, a man painting the sideboard, which is from Beer Lane by Hogarth. That particular image is taken from Beer Lane. And they're clearing out all the pews, because Stern modernised the interior of the church. So that's what's happening there. Oh, there's a, there's a, a bull peering over the, and a cock down at the bottom. So we've got a cock and a bull in there too. He's a clever graphic artist. Yes. So in answer to the question, of, would you please interpret this for me? I've done it. <laughs> uh, is there anything known about his writing habits? Because he was the, the, Sadly, there is, I mean, there is no manuscript material for him. There's a holograph version of the Sentimental Journey in the British Library, and there is references to the fact that he used to write at great speed, and that there was ink all over the place, but his hand, from the correspondence that we've got, is fine. Now, by habits, if you mean how he wrote, or when he wrote, or under what circumstances he wrote, he wrote predominantly at Shandy Hall. That was, he, was, he was in London a lot, he was in Italy a lot, he was in France a lot, but his writing was done in what he called his sweet retreat. Now you, if you're writing something, if you've, got, if you've got an academic paper to write, or if you've got something creative that you're writing, some of you say, I can't write unless I am sitting with my iPod, watching the television, yeah, <laughs> doing that sort of thing. Well, some people like to have certain circumstances because it makes them write better. While Stern found the writing place at Shelley Hall was conducive. We know that. Because he, felt, he said he felt like a prince when he was there. He used to give his sermons as well, but generally that is where he wrote. So we know that he wrote there, but his style, there's not much. Unfortunately, most of his correspondence was burnt by his brother-in-law. 
after Stern died, because it was, he was a vicar and he thought that there might be something that was contentious and was a problem, you know. And his daughter and his mother were, were horrified because that was where there would be future income. <laughs> the letters of Stern. So what they did was, rather than, because there weren't any, they found some subsequently, but at the time there wasn't any to put in volume, so what is the answer? You make them up. So the first set of Stern's letters are, are not composed by Stern. They're just forgeries. So we, we started to get our understanding of what some of the person Stern was by letters which were not his. Yeah. And that's pretty significant. You know, that's, that's, that fits in with, our, with our, the complex character. Every time you try to, to pin Stern down, it just disappears. The fog comes in. You can't be certain as to what sort of a person he was. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.